Okay, so today I've got Chris Golding from Melbourne United with me and we're going to chat all things corona isolation and a couple of things captaincy. So hello Chris, how are you? Good, how are you? Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, look, I'm really glad that you joined me for these chats and I'm really interested to find out how you're staying motivated and staying fit in your, your four walls um, and how you're coping. But first, before we get on to all of that kind of stuff, tell us a little bit about I guess your career, because it's been a long and awesome career. I can remember when you were here in Perth. That's how long you've been playing and in the NBL system. So tell us a little bit about your career and how you've landed in Melbourne and as captain. Yeah, so I, um, I grew up for most of my life um, in Brisbane, moved from Tasmania when I was young and um, grew up playing basketball there. And, you know, I wasn't a great basketballer when I was young. I was scrawny. I was little. I didn't develop until a little bit later. So um, I never had these grand plans of playing basketball as a career or what I would do for you know, professionally for almost half of my life now. So, um, yeah, I just loved doing it. I, I finished high school. Um, I took a year where I was working. I was working retail, um, selling shoes. I'd, worked cold calling people in call centers. I worked for a company that my mum worked for in the call center. Um, there was nothing flashy about what was going on with me at 16, 17 years old. Um, but every chance I got, I went to the basketball court and, um, you know, whether my friends or dad or someone was there to rebound for me or whether I was by myself, I would just try and get better. And, um, you know, it turns out I made a couple of teams that, um, I was able to play in front of some coaches that had some reach um, and from there, you know, made a, a, a Siebel team at the time, State League, um, played a couple of good games there and, and was seen by an NBL coach and it literally happened in the space of like six months, which was like super crazy, um, you know, making a first men's team. I was like, oh, this is amazing. Like I'll just sort of go on the road trip with the old fellas, listen to them, tell stories and um, just be a fly on the wall. And within six months, you know, I was then doing that at the next level, which was the NBL. So that was a cool little ride for me. Um, you know, I bounced around a couple of teams, whether that be because of their um, inability to continue as a business, um, which was quite relevant uh, or prevalent with some teams uh, in the NBL a few years ago. Um, so I bounced to Perth and spent a year, um, went back to Gold Coast. Um, and after the Gold Coast, I moved to Melbourne where, you know, predominantly the last seven, eight, nine years of my life, I've been based out of here. And, um, you know, it's where I've seen the most growth in my game um, in, in regards to results and, um, you know, being able to make teams, Australian teams, Olympic teams, World Cup teams. Um, but yeah, so I've been based in Melbourne for quite some time. My wife and I, with a little stop off in, in Spain for 10 months and a few months in Italy to, to take up some um, playing contracts. So that's pretty much a four or five minute rundown of my career. Um, you can dive in more if you'd like to. You've done, you've achieved some amazing things in your career. Was there ever a time pre-Melbourne, I guess, because that's where it really started to Brisbane and Melbourne, where it started to take off for you. Was there ever a time in those early years, you talk about when you were 16 and being starting in the system and stuff like that, that you didn't think NBL was going to be an option for you or you didn't think you'd make the Australian team and live this dream that you're living? Yeah, I mean, when I was a, a, a teenager, um, I, I honestly don't remember. I mean, I idolised basketball. as I, It's mm. all I wanted to do every chance I got. But when people ask me, what did you want to do with your life? That was never my answer. It was never, I want to be a professional basketballer just because I didn't think it was within the realm of possibilities for me. But, you know, every night or every morning I had, I was on the, the, the front driveway shooting a basketball, keeping neighbours up, the ball bouncing into their yard. I had to jump the fence, get the ball back. It was just, a, that was a constant for me was that I just loved the game of basketball and I loved pretending to be someone. I pretend to be Kobe Bryant and, and make game-winning shots or tricky layups and that sort of stuff. That was just my constant. If I had free time, that that that's what I was doing at home, um, at the park, at, you know, at the local association. It was just a, a constant love of mine that I that I 
always took with me. And yeah. um, as I got older and, and got a little better, I was like, hey, this is, this is awesome. If I can stretch this out, if I can do this for as long as possible, this is sure beats the hell out of selling Reebok shoes, which is what I was doing in, in, in Brisbane. Um, uh, but yeah, to be able to still be doing it now and, and, and now to even at the later stages of my career, turn my attention into the fact that I want to stay involved in the game after I finish playing um, in yeah. different respects. It's, it's pretty cool. I didn't think I'd be thinking like that if, I, if you asked 15-year-old Chris. So as part of your really long list of achievements and accolades, you, you're captain of Melbourne United now. How long have you been doing that? Uh, so this is my, when did we come uh, uh, just finished my third year as the captain of okay. Melbourne United. I want to talk a little bit about that because you and I have had a few chats on your leadership and I don't think you, I don't believe that you know how good a captain you are. So I want to talk to you a little bit about was that a goal of yours? What did you do to prepare for it? How did it come about for you? So for anybody out there thinking, I might try my hand at leadership or I'm not good enough for it. Tell us a little bit about your, your journey to leadership. Yeah, I think mine, um, it wasn't something I wrote on my wall. Or it wasn't something I wrote in a journal and was like, this is what I need to achieve by this time. I think yep. um, there was certain parts of the way I carried myself amongst my team that I thought um, had some leadership qualities that was noticed maybe, you know, years and years ago before um, when I was playing for the Melbourne Tigers, um, still a young guy, new to the group, but um, that was probably when I first, I think I remember calling my dad and I was like, oh, there was, you know, I was in the conversation for the leadership group or the, or the captaincy at, at such a time when I'd never thought of that before in my life. I was like, wow, that's interesting. Um, and I truly believe that in order to jump in and wholeheartedly um, commit yourself to that. You need people that um, sit above you or alongside you that you respect and that you can um, believe in their philosophies. And in our in our um, sport, the the philosophies of basketball and culture and and, and how to yep. um, not command a group but steer a group to a to a direction that um, everyone wants which is winning um, and for me that really hit home when Dean Vickerman um, was our coach um, he put a lot of trust in me over the over the preseason. Um, but I think that trust was earned because I was there I was working I was um, you know I was trying to put myself in the best position possible to take this group to where we wanted to get to um, so once it was raised um, and we had a bit of a player vote and, and, and some guys that I really respected um, threw my name in the ring for that, um, that's when I grabbed it and was like, hey, this is a privilege um, to try and do this the best way I can. And, you know, I'm, I'm still so new to the whole realm of captaincy and leadership that I make mistakes. And I'm sure throughout the last three years, we've had guys on my team that, possibly completely disagree disagree with the way that I go about um, my leadership. Um, that's part of the challenge. Um, yeah, or they just might not think I'm not that good a basketballer or whatever it is. And, and these obstacles can get in the way, but it's, it's tough and it's, it's important to try and work through those obstacles and try and figure out a way that we can get to a common goal because I'm not, I'm not the common goal. I'm, I'm someone that's, um, directing a group of men um, in our in our case towards a common goal with a couple of other directors and it gets difficult at times because people pull in different directions but it's how do we all manage to steer this ship in the right direction that we want to get to that um, it's challenging it's compelling and it's you know it, I, I love doing it because you know you lay in bed I know the rest of my teammates are probably asleep and I lay in bed thinking about what's happening here, what's happening there. Um, you know, it's a gift and a curse, but I, I wouldn't really change it. Yeah. So it is a it is a real role. It's not just a title. There's a lot of pressure that comes on captains, and I've seen that over the years. What do you think are the key characteristics or the key behaviours that help you be that strong, that good leader who who acknowledges the direction and the path? And like you say, there's those challenges and those those things that try to derail you from leading in in tough situations or when people disagree with you what would be the key behaviors or characteristics that leaders should be 
um, aspiring to or working on and could be working on in this time where we can't put the ball in the, in the hoop? Yeah, um, well, I think it's really important to, to establish first up, um, you know, you need cultures thrown about so much, um, but you need, say, a, a goal. We, we have a yeah. goal at Melbourne United and it's to win a championship. Yeah. If you are me as a, um, a player, first and foremost, and as a leader, if I'm committed to that goal, um, all right, now I know what I need to do. I've got a coach who's committed to that goal. We converse and speak openly and honestly about how we feel people and ourselves and, you know, um, and in our roles are going. So you need to be able to communicate in an open and honest way. In, in this day and age, people can get so caught off guard by hearing the truth or hearing something that isn't the, you know, the beautiful picture that they may have going on in their head about how they're performing or whatever it is. So being able to communicate in, a, in an honest way, sometimes I struggle with that. I'll be the first, uh, not so much, I'm, I'm too honest. I'll just say straight up, this is how it is. Sometimes with um, some ill regard for, for people's feelings. Um, yeah. And, you know, you, you've passed on the book of emotional intelligence about how to relate different scenarios to different people and that, you know, we're all not wired the same. So that's a big part of my next stage is trying to understand and have a bit more empathy for other people. Because when I get locked on a goal, I'm just like, all right, it's this way. This is what we need to do. You're with me. Let's go. If you're not, yeah. well, you're going to see that we're all going and you're going to catch up. So I, w I would say open and honest communication is a, is a big thing. Um, Self-motivation, I think. You know, I, I had a conversation with someone about this the other day, about this predicament that we're in. And self-motivated people will be fine. Yeah. Um, it's the people that, um, I don't want to say they're unmotivated, but other times they need someone to drag them along or they need to be told to do this or they need to, you know, this is where we're out in the wild here. You've got to, you got to figure this out for yourself. Um, so having that sense of motivation um, to get yourself up, to, to run laps of your kitchen, to do push ups, to do whatever it is, wall sits when it's not ideal, but at least it's something ticking towards your goal. And yeah. I'll be open in saying when I was younger, I, I may not have been in, the mindset I am now to know that I need to get up and do something every single day. It comes with experience um, to know that to get to where you want to be, you can't take two months where you do nothing except play call of duty and, and eat salt and vinegar chips on the couch because yeah. <laughs> every yeah. day you do that, that goal is getting further and further away. You know, for a lot of us, our goals may feel like they're getting further away as it is. So how can we climb that rope? How can we climb the ladder every day to just, stay inching towards the goal, I think is a massive thing um, that people should try and get in their minds. And, and it's tough because you speak to me about staying in the moment because that really is all we can control. So maybe it is, all right, I'm going to climb one rung of the ladder today. My one rung of the ladder looks like this today. It's 50 push-ups. It's a wall sit. It's, I'm just giving random examples. But yep. every day that you don't do that, and, and, and in saying that in our sport, recovery is a massive part of that as well so maybe today my rung of the ladder is i need to rest i need to i need to take a day for myself to clear my head read a book watch netflix do something like that um so i think that's a good way and a, and a, and a way that i've been looking at it is just to try and tick off little little things every day so self-motivation is a, is a massive thing because at the end yep. of the day if you're a leader, a captain, whatever, a leadership group, whatever it may be, and we're being asked to try and bust our asses to get to this goal. And you see the leader sitting like, oh, I can't really be stuffed today. I just, I just don't have it in me today. Everyone else turns and looks in that person and is like, well, maybe today's not that important. But yeah. when your goal's slipping away and you want to climb a rung every day, self-motivation to get yourself going because you never know who you can drag with you. Um, but as I said, that's come with a little bit of um, age, probably, as I'm a little bit older. Um, and uh, so those two, um, I'm sure other things will come to me as we speak, but they've been my biggest, biggest thing. And I mean, there's an, you have to have an essence of um, 
you know, you can't be so far up yourself, you know, like if you're going to yep. tell someone that you're, that they're doing it wrong, you best believe that that's coming back. And sometimes if you get people offside, it's coming back with more vigor and force than you ever threw it out um, with. So you have to be open to, to criticism and, and when you're asking people to be accepting of it um, with your open and honest communication, you sure as hell be, better be ready to get it back. Yeah. And we all have blind spots. It's a really good point you make. We all have blind spots in our performance and in our personality and things like that. So sometimes people reflect stuff to us that we haven't seen in ourselves or choose not to believe. So you're right. A hundred percent right. You have to be open to that kind of stuff and as well. Especially when you're younger as well, you probably yep. have more blind spots because no one's told 100%. you that before. And you're like, hang on, what? I do that. And then once it's, it's it's known to you you be like oh shit <laughs> they were right and i think that when we're younger we take feedback like somebody saying you're a shit person or a shit mm. shit player and that's not the reality if you can reframe that or use that feedback to say the process that you're using isn't great or isn't going to help you if you mm. can start to frame it like that instead of taking it like you're a bad person or a bad player then it becomes really, really helpful. And the earlier we can learn that in any of our careers, whether they're sport or business or whatever we're doing, the quicker we get to those goals that may seem far away. I wanna ask you a little bit about accountability. This is, this is a topic that comes up over and over and over again in my work as a performance psychologist, um, both in sport and in business, about accountability and it's, it plays out a lot in sports teams in a really obvious way. How do you keep people accountable as a leader or as a, as a teammate even? So moving away from the leadership thing, how do you keep people accountable? What steps do you use to keep them focused on that goal? And particularly in a time like now where that goal can seem um, almost invisible or so far away that it's somewhat meaningless. What's accountability yeah, so to you? <laughs> Um, it's massive because, um, well, especially if I put myself in, in the situation I'm in at a basketball club where people come mm. from all over the world, different walks of life. Um, they're the best where, wherever they've been, they come together. You now sit in a different, um, not, you don't want to say hierarchy, but it's just yeah. the, the, it's the way it goes. Some people are going to play more than others. Some people, um, uh, better than others at this point in their careers. It's just the way it goes. And That's sport. oftentimes, yeah, oftentimes what comes with that is some people that think they're better, think they can get away with the other stuff. Yeah. Now, skill is a, a, a certain thing that people can go up and down with depending on how hard they work or, or don't work. But the accountability side of, of our club or, or, or my leadership and, and Dean's leadership is that's the baseline. That's the leveler, you know, like no matter who you are, you're held to account to this. And it's a very challenging thing in professional sport when people make a lot of money and, you know, maybe just one little thing's off. So you're like, Oh, I won't bring that up. I won't bring that up today. We got a big game tomorrow. You don't want to get them offside. Uh, that's just snowball. That's just, because the next time it's something little, but it's just a little bit bigger. It's like, well, I'll let that go. This is not that different. And then before you know, you're letting go the biggest things that can seriously affect the team, a club, a season. Um, so for us, that's our baseline. It's no matter who you are, you're held accountable. And whether you're the 12th man on the roster or the head coach, you should be able to tell each other whether something's right or wrong. So for me, accountability is massive, but it's massive in the fact that I will make sure that I'm doing everything to the letter. To, to, I think to the letter until someone tells me that it's not. I make sure that I'm doing everything right. So if the time comes that I need to hold someone accountable, I can say, hey, um, you know, you're 10 minutes late. What's, what's going on here? We're supposed to start at 10 a.m. Well, if I've been 10 minutes late the past three days, that's not going to fly. But if I'm yep. consistently on time, I'm consistently early, I'm considered consistently ready, ready to clock in and do my job, well, then I can feel confident in myself and the rest of my team should feel confident in me to be able to say, hey, we start at 10, that's not on, you're letting the rest of us down. Yeah, sounds like there's a real connection between hard work and confidence. 
sitting in that accountability piece. And I can also hear that some of those things that you're pointing out that we can hold each other to account on are within your control. They're not random things. So it's really that control the controllables philosophy that we use a lot in sport. Yeah, and you know, there's so many things that go on in a game of basketball that are out of your control, that if you can focus in on, um, hey, and culprit, hey, I'm not gonna yell back at the refs. I'm not gonna argue with the refs because I'm taking precious time that we could have had as a group and I'm pushing that towards something that will not change. Yeah. Um, so yeah, controlling the controllables is a, is a great way to put it. Yeah. I wanna ask you about your biggest challenge in recent times or in your career, something that really sticks out where you had to not just, you know, let it happen and see what rolls, where you had to take control of that situation and be part of the solution. Is there something that's happened um, where you've been able to go, right, I'm in a crappy situation or a not ideal situation and you put together a solution, whether it be with the help and support of people, but you literally and purposely and consciously tried to fix that situation. Because I think sometimes when chaos happens, we tend to hope and pray and mm. wish a lot rather than taking control. So I'd be interested to see if you can, and I've put sort of thrown this in there, but if there's a situation <laughs> where yeah, you, ha you have driven, I mean, last season wasn't ideal for you guys. Yeah, Don't necessarily so want to focus on in on Melbourne, but that would be interesting for, to hear how yeah, so I can, you I pulled can that back on. on. That because okay. um, I'm a very vocal person when it comes to basketball. I'm vocal on the court. It's the way I communicate. Yeah. I, it's the way I make up for a lot of um, flaws in my game is being able to communicate on a defensive end and, and help people and, and put out fires before um, there's a blazing inferno. Um, it's just how I am. And whether it's because I'm an extrovert on court or whatever it is, I don't know. But us as a group this year, we had a lot of guys that just, it wasn't in their makeup to be loud and vocal on court. So we yep. could have um, training sessions that you could hear a pin drop. Now guys think they're going hard. They're, they're, they're working hard. They're doing all the right things, but you could literally, if I were, if me or one or two other guys wasn't, weren't speaking and communicating and, and, and making the, the level of practice to what we say championship level um you could hear a pin drop in 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 practices and you know for myself for dean this was a problem because we didn't think we were getting to that competitive championship level we were kind of yeah. going through the motions um and it got to a point where we were imploring other people to try and come on you do you take over you try and do this and i, and I got to a point this year where i was just like look we've got I don't know how what, what it was. We've got six weeks left. I'm going to leave practice every single day, horse in the throat. I, this is a stone that I will not look back on and say, gee, I wish I flipped that over. That was yeah. one of my things this year. I'm going to drive our practices um, to a championship level in the way that they sound and the competitive nature, whether it be talking shit. I hate, I hate smack talking. It's, I dislike it. But there were some yeah. times this year where I had to take my own personal game out of it and start talking smack mm -hmm. to get other guys going and involved to get this competitive nature at practice. Um, and I'm sure there was, you know, a lot of guys on our team had had those sort of realizations that, hey, this isn't exactly what I want to want to be doing right now. But for the betterment of the group for the next six, eight weeks, every day I come into practice, we need to be here. We can't cruise along and be here because we, we've been doing that and it hasn't been pretty on game day. When we can consistently get to here on a training level throughout the week, get to this championship level, we've seen that our results on the weekend are here. So how can guys uh, manipulate the way they approach practice to consistently be at that level? So it's not all doom and gloom. It wasn't, oh, how the hell are we going to do this? You know, we were still kind of sitting in the playoff hunt and, Mm. It wasn't the end of my career, but it was certainly a challenge to have to, you know, look, no one else is going to do this, you know, take it upon yourself. Um, and at the end of the year, who knows, maybe you can be champions, but if, if, if you don't do it, you're sure as hell not going to be judging by the results. 
Yeah. And you make some really good points. And I love the piece where you said no one else is going to do it. And I think that's a really important point to make, even though what, what we're involved in most is a team sport, you still have to be responsible for your training, your attitude, your effort, what you bring to training every, every training session and what you bring to games every game day. So I think that's a, a massive point. How do you want to be remembered as a leader? What, what do you want your legacy to be? Um, <clears throat> well, first and foremost, I, I want to be a winner. I think that's what everyone wants. Um, you know, I, I've been lucky enough to be a championship winning captain. So I think that's something that when I look back years and years and years down the track will probably be one of the biggest things that I'm most proud of. Yeah. Um, um, and it's, it's such a broad um, term or label to put on someone, but it, it's so common that when you see someone good leader, oh, that, he's a good leader. He's a great leader. That gets thrown about in AFL circles, in basketball circles, you know, you tell me them right now, we could name them, you know, like in every sport you can name them. So I would, yep. if, if someone were to look at me um, a million years down the track, that, that would be amazing for them to say I was a good leader. Yeah. I think you're on track, Chris. I could talk to you all day, um, but obviously I want you to go back to your training and your preparation for <laughs> the off season. What advice do you have for the youth, the young basketballers, the aspiring NBL players sitting out there um, demotivated and feeling like it's so far away to ever be able to get out of their house, let alone back to school, let alone back to team sport? What can you offer up? What's keeping you focused at the moment? Oh, I, I would think... Um you know, that's, it's common because there's days when I wake up and I think my, you know, my initial thoughts are, you know, this is another week where I'm not going to get to shoot a basketball. Um, you know, real, realistically, there's no reason to pick up a basketball right now, you know? Um, yep. So it's, it, it's common to have those thoughts that are we ever going to get out of this? Can I ever get back to, you know, getting back to normality or whatever you feel it might be, but, um, the biggest thing I've found that throughout this is if you can push yourself to get active, do some type of exercise or workout or, you know, whether it be a mental workout, something to push you, as I said before, to push you a little bit closer to that goal so that whenever we go back to normality, we're that tiny bit closer to where we need to be. Um, yeah. Even if we're working just to stay in the same spot far away from the goal, you know what I mean? You don't want to drop back. So That's if you can point. just find it within yourself to do something um, in that regards, immediately after you'll feel better. So I, I have days where I wake up, we'll go for a walk, we'll grab a coffee, um, try not to break any social distancing laws, get back to the house as soon as we can. And I sit there and go, well, what am I going to do for the next eight hours while my wife works? You know, but when I finally, all right, this is what I'm going to do today. This is my workout for today. And I'm running up and down my living room, push up, squats, slides, side to side, around the kitchen. I try and get myself to that point of exhaustion where I know that I've worked and I've, uh, I've done what I need to. I can sit down, have a drink of water and be like, and just immediately, mentally, I feel so much better about the day. So that would be yeah. my advice is try and motivate yourself to, to do something, stay active, get a little bit better every day and... Um, you know, on the other side of that, it might be hell while you're doing it. You might not like doing whatever the exercise is, but on the other side of that, you'll feel so much better. You're going to be grateful that you did it. Chris, I, I'm very grateful for your time and really grateful for your insights and I wish you well in the rest of lockdown and can't wait to see you back on court next season. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Chris.